Hey guys, Metal Jesus here, and welcome to a part of my game room that I don't always show on my channel, but actually I use it quite a bit. Now, many of you know that I love collecting big box PC games, specifically games from the 80s and 90s, and often I get questions as to how I play those games. Well, in this video, I'm gonna show you the three computers that I use to play those games. I have a Windows 98 machine, a Windows XP machine, and a Windows 10 laptop. And so in this video, I'll show you each of those setups in detail, as well as a bunch of gameplay footage. Let's take a look. We're gonna go ahead and start with my Windows 98 machine. Now, if you've been watching my channel for a while, you know that I had this machine built to spec by a local Seattle company called RePC a couple years ago. RePC is a company that takes in old computers and electronics and will either clean them up, fix them up, and then resell them to the public, or they properly recycle them. And so what I wanted them to do was build me a computer as though I had traveled back in time, walked into a computer store in 1999 and just bought one off the shelf. And so this is a pretty sweet machine, especially for a gamer like me. Let's go ahead and go over the hardware. We started with a Dell Dimension XPS R400 say that five times, but basically in here, there is a 3DFX Voodoo 3. There is a Sound Blaster 16 plug and play sound card. Uh, it's powered by a Pentium 2 400 megahertz and it's got 384 megabytes of RAM. It also has two CD-ROM drives. One of them is a burner, just in case you need it. Plus it's got two hard drives in there. It's got a two gigabyte and also a one gigabyte hard drive, which admittedly is actually a little on the small side. I think they decided to go with that because they wanted to make sure that those hard drives would be viewable and usable in MS-DOS. That's, that's my guess with that, but it, I am running out of space there. And then connected to that, I have one of my favorite monitors of all time. It's an IBM P96. It's a 19 inch monitor with a native display resolution of 1600 by 1200, and it'll go up to 85 Hertz. And then obviously it's in a four by three aspect ratio, which is perfect for all of those 80s and 90s video games. You also see here my natural Microsoft keyboard. I don't know if they even make these anymore for people, but I got kind of addicted to them and it feels very natural to me. Uh, I like how this is built and designed. I don't know, again, if anyone uses these anymore, but it's just something I'm used to, so I like to use it. I've also got a Microsoft Sidewinder gamepad. This is a USB connected controller. And for the most part, it works really well. Also one of my favorite mice or mouses of all time. This is the Microsoft IntelliMouse. And so the design and idea of this computer is really twofold. It's designed to run old MS-DOS games very well because it's got, you know, as I said, it's got a 3DFX Voodoo 3 in there, which is very well supported in DOS uh, and games, you know, that would use 3D acceleration. But more importantly, it also has the Sound Blaster 16, which again is very important when it gets to old MS-DOS games because Despite there being a ton of other sound cards that you could get at the time, some of them definitely better than the Sound Blaster 16, there's no denying that the, the support for Sound Blaster 16 was, you know, it was almost universal. And so that's what I was really looking for here. And then the benefit of going with some of these standard components is that you have the best support in Windows 98, which is notoriously uh, buggy. I, you know, I don't know how many of you remember going back and playing Windows 98 games, but even for making this video, I was running into a lot of just challenges. I mean, it's funny because sometimes I would just boot up Windows, you know, a cold boot, <laughs> and I would get a, a Windows error for no reason. It's just that for what, you know, it's just an operating system that is really buggy. And so, and so my recommendation to anybody who's thinking of doing this, you know, again, you can get some very exotic options for sound cards and video cards, but I recommend you just go with what is tried and true, which is best supported and uh, start from there. 
And like I said, this computer will run both MS-DOS games and also Windows 95 slash 98 games really well. But there are some tricks and some things that you need to know about. The first one being is that a lot of MS-DOS games, especially ones that just will not run in Windows, will probably require you to make a boot disk. And what a boot disk is, it's a floppy disk that is formatted to have the MS-DOS system on it and basically bypass all of Windows and go straight into DOS. But more importantly, to configure your computer specifically for that game. So usually that involves the management of memory. Sometimes early games needed a lot of conventional memory. Some of them needed extended memory. And so just be aware that if you're gonna start playing MS-DOS games, you're probably gonna need to learn a little bit about building a boot disk. Now, the good thing is, almost every game you'll you'll buy, um, especially if you get the physical version like I own, they'll have little manuals in there to help you out. They'll basically tell you exactly what they expect and often they'll give you examples of how that boot disk should look. And some games like Full Throttle here, actually has a boot disk maker within the installation. So they knew that, you know, the vast majority of people were going to need to create a boot disk. And so it'll prompt you actually to make a boot disk. That said, there's also modern websites out there that you can go to and you'll be able to actually get examples. Uh, you'll get more help. You'll also just get the ability to download some of the files that you need today. So running, you know, boot disk sounds scary, but running a lot of these games today actually is much easier than it was when they originally came out. Now let's go ahead and swing over and take a look at my Windows XP machine, which I've had for a long time. I actually built this machine, uh, you know, probably 20 years now. It's been quite a while and it's definitely been a workhorse in my game room. I absolutely love it. So this has an AMD Athlon XP 2100 plus processor in there that is running at 1.73 gigahertz. Uh, there are two gigabytes of RAM in here, and then the video card is an ATI Radeon 8500. As for the sound card on this computer, I'm just using the one that's built onto the motherboard. So it's a Realtek audio chip that was very common on motherboards at the time, and it's well supported in Windows, so I've never had a problem with it. And then this machine has two hard drives in there as well. Uh, the C drive is a 30 gigabyte drive, and then the D drive is a 200 gigabyte drive, which is plenty of space for anything that I would want to put on there. Um, it's been really nice because again, on this machine, there's plenty of room for games. And then as to what's connected to it, it's all of the same stuff as my Windows XP machine. So the same monitor, mouse, keyboard, controller, etc. Now I could get a switcher for all of that. Um, and that's probably something I should do in the future. But honestly, I really only have one of these machines hooked up at one time. It's not that big of a deal for me to climb underneath the desk and you know unplug them from one machine to another. But just be aware that you can get keyboard mouse switchers and stuff like that that would, that would do that for me. I just haven't bought one yet. And so my Windows XP machine solves an issue that you know, the Windows 98 machine doesn't do. And that is, of course, run games that are just slightly newer. It's kind of designed for games that are specifically for Windows. And, you know, from the year 1999 to maybe, I don't know, 2006 or so, I'm kind of guessing there, but this is what this one's kind of designed for. You know, when games finally fully switched over to Windows. And so um, that's what this runs really well. And uh, that's what I kind of use it for. Although that's not to say that it won't run older games too. It's just very spotty at what, you know, what will run and what won't. Because again, those early games were not designed for any version of Windows. And so you will run into compatibility problems, especially on Windows XP, getting some 3DFX games to run or DOS games. You know, that's, that's why I have these two older computers. That said, there is a little trick that you can do in Windows XP uh, that people I think kind of forget about. So for instance, I have this game here called Firefight. So this was originally released in 1996, probably for Windows 95, I would assume, um, maybe Windows 98, I don't remember at the time. But when you first put, put the CD-ROM in the drive, it will not run. It, you double click on it and it doesn't do anything, at least on my computer. So uh, it's obviously not, 
you know, configured or doesn't know what Windows XP is. The solution here is very simple and I recommend most people do it if you're having problems running older games is that you can go into its properties of the actual game on the disc and there is a compatibility tab there where if you check it, now it'll be unchecked by default, but you can actually turn on a compatibility mode in Windows XP to try to trick the game to thinking that you're running Windows 95 or Windows 98, whatever. So I typically do select Windows 98 and sure enough, as soon as I did that, the game launches and runs just fine. And so these two computers here give me the ability to run 20, maybe 25 years worth of PC games on real hardware. Tens of thousands of games potentially you could run on these two machines as they were meant to be ran. It's pretty cool. Keep it in your pants, pal. And then the other gaming PC that I use as well is this newer Dell Inspiron 7586 laptop that runs Windows 10. And the hardware is pretty decent for a laptop that was released in 2019. Uh, it's an Intel i7 CPU running at 1.8 gigahertz, although I think it can boost up to three perhaps. And then it's got 16 gigs of RAM. Um, and then it's got uh, about 475 gigabytes of hard drive storage. And there are two reasons why I bought this laptop. The first one being is that it's portable because a lot of people have asked me, you know, do you have a Windows gaming PC in the game room? And the answer is no, because I don't really want to have a big old tower with keyboards and mouse, all that stuff sitting there. Uh, I much prefer a portable solution like a laptop because I get the benefits primarily of both. I mean, obviously the power is not there, but the portability is. I like that I can sit it down you know, on the coffee table, connect it to my modern television and it just works really easily and then I can quickly store it away. And so this laptop functions as my GOG machine. I do have Steam on here, but primarily because it is a laptop and you know, laptops aren't super powerful, it is powerful enough to run games from GOG. Now, if you're not familiar with GOG, they are good old games. And what they do is they license, resurrect, repackage, re you know, update old PC games to run on modern hardware. And uh, you see my library here. And it, it, what I love about GOG is that, again, they are keeping a lot of these games alive and making it really easy to run. So yes, I you know, often have the original physical version of a game and I obviously have the old hardware, but it is nice to also have something that I can just very quickly, you know, whip out and play on a 60 inch HD television as well. And then the second reason why I own this laptop is because I have a YouTube channel and some of the things I need to do, I can only do on a modern version of Windows, um, specifically a lot of game capture and stuff like that. If I'm having problems capturing on my Mac or something like that, it's nice to have a Windows machine that I can kind of go, is this a Mac problem or is this a Windows problem? And, and often I'm kind of bouncing back and forth. Also, some of the utilities that you get with, you know, some of these devices that are sold, like say a firmware update or something like that, they won't support Mac and you need a Windows machine to update the firmware or something like that. It's just, it's good to have that. And then the question I get a lot is, why am I not just running a virtual machine on a modern computer? You know, you can run virtual versions of MS-DOS, Windows 95, 98, 2000, you know, all that stuff in a virtual machine, wouldn't that just be easier? And the answer is, sometimes it is. Now it's been my experience with VMs and admittedly I haven't messed around with one probably in a couple years, but yeah, it's really impressive to run a virtual machine of Windows 98 and you know, many games will run on it. But I've also experienced that a lot of games won't, especially during that time period of 3D acceleration. You know, kind of the late 90s and early 2000s, the, the transition between 98 and Windows XP and all that, some of those games that really wanted you to have a 3DFX glide video driver support or something like that, they just won't run on a VM or you end up running it with software mode or, you know, or the graphics don't look right. And so, yeah, that would probably work with a lot of games and probably the more popular games are probably better supported because they would have more eyeballs on it, more work done. But, you know, 
Sometimes I want to play those kind of weird, obscure, hidden gems. And what I was finding at least, you know, several years ago is that many of those didn't work in a VM. So, and also too, to be quite honest, I just really like having, you know, the real hardware, you know, it's cool to have the real hardware. I got the real games. It's cool to have the real hardware. So that is a quick look at the three computers that I use to run my old PC games, but I would love to know how you are running old PC games down in the comments below. I know many of you have old real hardware like I do. Some of you, you know, just enjoy the convenience of GOG and DOSBox, which is totally fine. Maybe you're running some VMs and you've got some, some suggestions and tweaks for me. Let me know down in the comments below. And as always, I want to thank you for watching my channel. Thank you for subscribing and take care. Hey guys, Metal Jesus here. And today I'm back with a video that is hopefully the first of many where I share with you my entire big box PC game collection. Now that is a very daunting task because the PC section of my game room and my collection is by far the largest. I have two full rooms dedicated to it. We're in my office right here. And then also the room across the hall is filled up with mostly PC games from many, many different eras and many, many different computers. Uh, plus I've also got some stuff in storage. So my plan is, is to hopefully break these up into multiple episodes, multiple videos, sharing them over the next couple weeks or months if you guys like them. So if you like this idea and you wanna see more of them, please give this video a thumbs up. That really helps me out. But for this video, I thought I would start in this corner right here and primarily focus on the 1990s. And so I'm not really sure how long this is gonna take. And so I'm really gonna probably cover this to maybe down here or so. We'll see how far we get and then we can cover the rest in another video and over there and all that sort of stuff. Um, but yeah, this is gonna be mostly, I believe, 1990s era stuff. There is some little bit newer things in there. So let's go ahead and take a look. All right, so I'm gonna start with the oversized stuff on the top here. Now what's crazy is that I'm referring to big box PC games, which are large, well, these are the large of the large. These are the largest of those. And so that's why they're actually up here because they take up the most room. Starting with this right here. Now this is actually the remastered collection of the new version of Command and Conquer. So that is actually, you know, the new version of Command and Conquer that came out digitally probably a year or two ago, I think I'm trying to remember when that was released, but Limited Run put out the physical version of that. And so, Man, that version is awesome to have. It's great to see a digital game, a new digital game, get a physical version. Next to that, we have the Marathon Trilogy box set by Bungie. So I'm sure some of you know this, many of you may know this, but actually Bungie started off as a Mac game developer. And their, their big title at the time was Marathon, which you know, no surprise is a first person shooter. And this box is pretty cool because uh, it's a collection of, you know, the trilogy, plus there is an art book in there. And again, it's just a really cool piece of Bungie history. Next up is the Wing Commander 3 Heart of the Tiger. This, I forget what the, this is technically called, this version of, but as you can see, the box is freaking massive. So, you know, when Wing Commander 3 was released, its big selling point was that it was gonna be a Hollywood quality interactive movie. It even says that on the cover there. And so this was a celebration of that idea. So it actually comes in this big box, but inside there's a 35 mill millimeter film can package. Uh, there is a Wing Commander 3 t-shirt, which is actually pretty hard to find. It took. It took me a long time to actually get that to complete that collection because most people who bought it probably wore the shirt. So it took a little while to get that to make it complete. This is another one of my favorite special editions right here. This is, this is a new release. So this is Planescape Torment slash Icewind Dale, the enhanced versions. So this was originally made available through, I believe it's their Kickstarter or their Indiegogo campaign. But I guess it doesn't really matter. But, you know, it was a crowdfunded version of it. Had to buy this because Planescape Torment is one of my all-time favorite RPGs. 
and this is just a fantastic version of it. Lots of little cool feelies in here, including a squishy version of Mort, the skeleton that follows you around and taunts you in the game. Uh, plus it's got this Icewind Dale medallion. It's, it's kind of cool and unusual that a collector's edition has two very different games in it. You know, they're both obviously very similar in style, but they were very different franchises back in the day. And so it's cool that that, that even exists really. These are kind of an oddity. I'm not entirely sure what the deal is with these, but as you can see here, I've got these oversized versions of the Doom Trilogy and also Duke Nukem 3D. So each one of these is a collection of the games released up to that point. The Duke Nukem one actually has a bunch of extra stuff in here, the Kiloton Collection, but they're in these massive oversized boxes, which I want to say was probably maybe sold at Costco's. It's kind of something that that would be very Costco-like to have a bunch of software bundled up like that in a large package because actually inside there, it's mostly empty space, which is pretty weird. And kind of along those lines, you have the Half-Life Adrenaline Pack from Sierra. Um, this is again, another one that is bundled together. Although I don't think this was released to, I don't think this was actually made for Costco. I think this is probably just, you know, one of those versions where they bundled a bunch of stuff together. Cool thing is that that actually does have the, the full size manuals, which is great. Here's another one that's newer. And this is one of my all time favorite special editions. This is Doom Sigil. So this was John Romero going back and creating the proper follow up to Doom 2. And man, this is absolutely amazing that they did this. It's signed, it's got a bunch of cool stuff in there. One of my all time favorites. And then at the end here is something I've had off and on in my collection for the last couple of years. Um, this is a sealed copy of Gabriel Knight, Sins of the Father. The reason why I have this up there is one is because it's obviously this kind of weird shaped box. They call it the origami box. Um, I was at Sierra when we released this. This was a very cool, weird box that was put out. Very collectible these days. This actually left Sierra when my buddy Josh left there. So it's technically Josh's game. And then sometimes he has it in his game collection. Sometimes I have it in mine, but it's uh, just part of my history and it's kind of cool to have. So, all right, down here is where I have some of my iconic and favorite first person shooters. There's actually quite a bit of first person shooting going on in the, the 90s, as you would you know expect. Starting off with a game that I couldn't believe I found this sealed, brand new in a pawn shop. That of course is the shareware version of Duke Nukem 3D in just perfect condition. I was on vacation in this little small town over in Eastern Washington. I went into a pawn shop and there it was like with a beam from heaven shining down on it. And it was super cheap, probably been sitting there for decades, you know, and it was just waiting for me to pick it up. So that's a pretty cool thing in my collection. Uh, below that we have System Shock. Actually, I should probably mention here, we have the original version of System Shock right here, as well as the new version put out and remastered by uh, Night Dive Studios. So System Shock at the time was an absolutely groundbreaking first person shooter slash adventure game. It really, it was a shooter, but it also played very much like an adventure game. The thing about it is, is that it, it was pretty, it was very early on at, you know, when first person shooters were being made. And so the controls are really weird today. Very clunky. It's awesome that Night Dive Studio took it, remastered it, made it run on modern systems. And that's what that special edition is right there. As well as one of my all time favorite first person shooter games. I love this game. That of course is System Shock 2. <sighs> Man, I mean, this left such an amazing impact on me when I played this game. It's survival horror, it's a shooter, it's got an amazing story, it's got really creepy characters, a fantastic enemy that, that Shodan who, who taunts you the whole game. Oh man, such a brilliant game. Next to that, of course, you gotta have Quake 1 and 2. I remember playing Quake 1 and 2 
when they were new and they were groundbreaking and you know they just have to be a part of every single game collection it's it's a requirement if you actually care about first person shooters as well as the original wolfenstein so here you see i have wolfenstein 3d as well as the spear of destiny and i remember like yesterday seeing wolfenstein 3d running on my friends he probably had a 386 25 or something like that but man it was just so much fun so amazing to see running for the first time and then this box of spear of destiny is beautiful i love the artwork on there as well as this I don't know what this is called. I guess it's like a shareware version of Wolfenstein 3D, but it comes with Blakestone uh, Aliens of Gold. And I, I believe that technically Blakestone is the first 3D first person shooter. I think that's true. Next to that, we have, again, one of my all time favorite shooters. That of course is the original Deus Ex. And so I have two of them here. The, uh, this, I believe this is the original North American release as well as the game of the year edition but i think this actually was released in a different country well it has the esrb rating i don't know but um deus ex again changed the game it was one of the first times i ever played a first person shooter that gave me true choice it allowed you to change the outcome of the story in really cool and interesting ways and so that was definitely very memorable at the time here is a series that is near and dear to my heart. That is No One Lives Forever. I have two versions of the original game here. Man, these are awesome. They're kind of homages to, you know, the 1960s, the groovy kind of uh, almost Austin Powers like spy genre. Fantastic games really like funny, smart, great graphics, great gameplay. I'm bummed though, I seem to have lost the second game because I really like the second game too. So, uh, but I have two versions of No One Lives Forever. That is a series I would love to see make a comeback one of these days. Here is the original Halo. It's just really cool having a big box version of the original Halo. I don't know how common this is. I, you know, I always think of the Xbox version when, when I think of Halo, but uh, getting, yeah, getting the big box version is pretty cool. I have two versions of Kiss Psycho Circus. That is another really weird first person shooter that came out around that time. And, you know, I'm a big Kiss fan. And so of course this is a given. It's not my favorite first person shooter by a long shot, but it is cool that there were a couple different versions of it. I believe they released each of the members with their own cover because that's a very KISS thing to do. <laughs> so as you see here, I have two of them, which is cool. And here are two other first person shooters, both very different. The first one being Strife. So Strife is an old school style, you know, first person shooter, but it's also got role playing elements added to it. And at the time, this was very groundbreaking. Uh, it's still a really fun game today. You can actually get it on GOG remastered or updated for modern systems and then you have 13 which was a game i originally played i believe on the probably the xbox but that's based on a graphic novel has a really cool graphic style and so um you know a, a game that actually recently got i guess a reboot remaster but i didn't play it because most people didn't like it so didn't hear good things love to know what you guys thought down in the comments below all right next to that we're getting into the LucasArts games and the Star Wars games specifically in this little section right here. So what's to say here? There's a couple ones that I really want to point out. Um, you know, episode one, pod racer, or I guess it's just called racer. I would say pod racing because that's technically what it is. You know, just one of my all time favorite racing games. Uh, plus you also have the Jedi Knight games here. Man, those are awesome games. I love the Jedi Knight series. Uh, and then also the Rebel Assault series, Rebel Assault 1 and 2. Now, I don't know about you, but you know, at the time that Rebel Assault came out, as a Star Wars fan, I was starving for some new Star Wars stuff. This was before, I believe, the new versions came out and certainly before the Episode 1 game, or games, the Episode 1 movies came out. And so these were kind of like a I don't know, just like a fan love letter of new content, new Star Wars content. And the fact that it was 
filmed, it just felt like, wow, this could be part of the Star Wars universe. And so at the time, that was pretty awesome to get. Over here, you have all of the X-Wing and the TIE Fighter games. Uh, I've mentioned before that TIE Fighter is probably one of my all-time favorite games. I haven't played it in a long time, but man, I was hooked on that series for a long time. I didn't really get into the X-Wing because I kind of like the bad guys. They got the cooler outfits, you know, and then the story was awesome, but uh, that's, I believe, most of them right there. Up above there, we have an adventure game that when it came out was making a lot of news. That is The Dig. So this is a LucasArts adventure game. But what was interesting about it is that it was made with or in collaboration with Steven Spielberg. Now you have to remember back then that games were still probably considered to be for children. You know, they weren't necessarily taken seriously as a true creative medium by a lot of people. And so to have Steven Spielberg go, you know what, I'm gonna help with a game and help create its story and its vision. And we got The Dig. Now, I like The Dig. It's got a pretty cool trippy story, but it's not my favorite by a long shot. It's, in many ways, it's very obtuse. A lot of times you just don't know what the heck you're supposed to do. Some people love that. For me, I found it a little bit frustrating, but again, it's a, it's a cool part of gaming history. And then here's something that has become quite collectible over the last couple of years. That is the LucasArts archives. Now I have volume one right here. So this is very much like what they did up here where they basically would bundle in a bunch of games and you could just, as a consumer, you know, very quickly get fairly cheaply a bunch of really great LucasArts games. What's interesting though, is that these have become somewhat collectible. Uh, I did not see that coming at all. So not that that's necessarily a bad thing. It's just that, again, I was kind of surprised that, yeah, people who, I guess probably people who are going for a complete LucasArts collections, this is one of them that you want to get. And I think a lot of people probably didn't keep the packaging. They would just throw it away and keep the CDs, you know, next to their computer. Um, but yeah, so it's cool to have that in the collection. Next to that, I have three Indiana Jones games all published by LucasArts. I always kind of forget that there were so many Indiana Jones games that were released by them. And what was cool is that they each one pushed the technology a little bit further. You know, they started off as 2D, you know, traditional adventure games, and then eventually worked up to full 3D, almost like Laura Croft and Tomb Raider, which makes total sense because you can, you know, that's kind of what he does, right? He, he, he does the, the tomb raiding thing. And then next to that, oh man, I know I've mentioned it before, but Full Throttle is my all-time favorite adventure game. I know that's kind of blasphemy because it should be probably a Sierra game. No, it's this one. It's because it just has everything I love in it. It's got a awesome rock and roll soundtrack. It's got Ben, who's a badass. Uh, you've got motorcycles. It's a little bit in the future. It's po kind of post-apocalyptic. It's funny. It's not too long. It's just, it's so awesome. Oh, and of course it stars Mark Hamill. Anything that has Mark Hamill, it's good. So yeah, this is really cool to have. Next to that, I have three, I guess the first three Monkey Island games. Um, so I have The Secret of Monkey Island. I have Monkey Island 2, LeChuck's Revenge, and Curse of Monkey Island. Next to that is another one that is a great adventure game that I think a lot of people are finally catching on. That of course is Grim Fandango. Another game that is wickedly funny, and it got to actually remaster. So I replayed that on, I think the Xbox 360. I also have it on the iPad. I think I've also got it on like, I don't know, the Vita or something like that. Uh, and then next to that is Maniac Mansion Day of the Tentacle. I don't have the original Maniac Mansion. Actually, I, I'm missing quite a few other LucasArts games. Oh yeah, and I have Sam and Max hit the road. Many old school LucasArts games are actually fairly collectible these days. And specifically, you know, the original Maniac Mansion, Loom is another one that can basically get hundreds of dollars if it's in perfect condition. So there's definitely a lot that I could add to this, but for the most part, those are, you know, the LucasArts games that I really loved and played a ton in the 1990s. Over here is my Wing Commander slash space arcade sim section of it. Now I'm not gonna spend a ton of time on the Wing Commander series because I actually did a full video talking about the entire collection in here. Um, and the Wing Commander 
series, there's a lot there's a lot to that. You've got the original games, you've got expansion packs, um, you know, you've got spin-offs and stuff like that. Uh, I started collecting, actually this is given to me by a friend, so there's even the Wing Commander books. Uh, the only thing really to point out of here that maybe I haven't talked a lot about is the Privateer series. So the Privateer games were basically based on Wing Commander, but they allowed you to play it however you wanted to. So you could be a pirate, uh, you could be a trader, you could be good, you could be bad. That was really fun about those games. Uh, another game in here, it's not related to Wing Commander in any way, but it is a space game. And it's probably inspired by Wing Commander, but I want to point it out that is Tachyon the Fringe by Nova Logic, so not even the same publisher, but um, it reminds me very much of the Wing Commander series. The main character kind of looks like the main character from the Wing Commander series, but what's awesome about it is that it's got Bruce Campbell in, the, in this game, and any game with Bruce Campbell is automatically bumped up a couple points in my book, because I love that dude. He's so funny. All right, moving on. Another LucasArts game that just didn't have room to put up there. But man, is it awesome. And I think a lot of people are finally catching on to this. That, of course, is Outlaws. Very early, not necessarily the technically best looking first person shooter, but at the time it was one of the first first person shooters to be based in a Western. And so that was a pretty cool you know, feature about this. It made it really stand out. I don't think it necessarily sold very well, but a lot of people like me today look back on this game very fondly. Next to that is a game I absolutely love. Did not get a, a whole lot of love when it came out, unfortunately. That is Shogo Mobile Armor Division. And essentially this game is, man, it's all sorts of awesome. So it's a first person shooter, but what's cool about it is that you are both as a pilot on foot, but then you'll go into these big mechs. And so the scale of the game changes all the time. Uh, plus it's just wickedly funny, it's hilarious. I just, man, I mean, you want to talk about a hidden gem. This is it. I, if, talk to people who have played this game, they'll all tell you it is criminally, you know, overlooked for sure. Above that, we have a sealed version of Shadow Warrior. This is the shareware version here. Um, I forget where I got this. I, I don't remember, but... Uh, again, the shareware versions are cool because for a lot of people, this is the version that they played back in the day. Uh, below that, we have John Romero's Die Katana, sealed as well. So yeah, that's pretty funny. I didn't play this game a lot. I have it on GOG. It's one of those games where I, I am intending to go back and play. I know it, I think it underperformed in sales when it was first released. That's the kind of feeling I get. But anyways, uh, below that we have two Blood games. Actually, one of them is a, I guess it's basically an expansion pack for Blood. And then the other one is the sequel Blood 2, The Chosen. So Blood is a first person shooter, survival horror kind of, very gory. Um, I don't have the original Blood big box version because that is another game that's also very collectible, very sought after. I've lost many eBay <laughs> attempts to get that game. Um, it's just one of those that's kind of hard to get. Now, when you're talking first person shooters, you got to have some doom in there. I have a couple doom. I have a couple dooms in here. So um, I have Doom 2 for the Macintosh for some reason. I don't know why. Uh, the original CD-ROM of Doom. I have the Doom screensaver. Remember screensavers and how important that was? But yeah, I have the Doom one. And then I've got a, a copy of Final Doom. Final Doom is kind of interesting because I don't think it's technically released by id Software. I think it was a compilation, if I remember right, of just a bunch of mods and wads and things like that. Uh, I believe there's also a version of Final Doom on, I think the original PlayStation, right? Here are two really kind of curious games from Bethesda. You know, we think of Bethesda today and you think of obviously the Elder Scrolls or you think, uh, you know, Fallout. Well, you know, way back in the 90s, they did Terminator first person games and you have two of them right here. You have Future Shock and also 2029. So I guess that probably translates a little bit into, you know, the post-apocalyptic Fallout series. I guess they probably took what they learned from the Terminator and brought it into that. And it probably makes some sense. Maybe, I'm just kind of guessing there. Uh, next to that, we have Sin. 
a game when this originally came out. There was some hype for it, but unfortunately it also, I believe, competed with the original Half-Life. So it was probably a little bit unfairly overlooked at the time. Uh, Shadowcaster, that's an origin game, a little bit unusual. Actually, Shadowcaster, Hexen, and also Cyclones are the same developer, the Ravensoft. And so, yeah, Raven Software, which is still around even today. I believe they're working on, I wanna say the Call of Duty series. I should probably know that, but um, again, early first person shooters. This is a relatively new game added to my collection. Well, new to my collection, but it's an old game. Uh, it's Cyclones. What is kind of weird about this is that it is SSI, which is a developer publisher. Yeah, I guess they're a publisher known for fantasy RPGs, D&D games, and to see a first person shooter, they probably published this because they needed to have, or at least try to get into the first person market. That's what that is. Uh, then you have Battlefield uh, 1942. You have the original and also the road to Rome. All right, moving right along. These are kind of curious. Remember Elvira? So. These are highly regarded adventure games based on Elvira, which is pretty trippy. So uh, the first one is based on the movie that she put out back in the day. And then The Jaws of Cerberus is the sequel. And I believe this is all new, but man, I love that cover. That cover on the second game is freaking epic. Those are cool. Uh, and then down here, we've got a little bit of mishmash of a lot of stuff here. Forsaken is a, um, it's a Descent clone. So if you're familiar with Descent, this is very similar to that. This had a, a t-shirt in here, which I don't have anymore. Um, and this had a very controversial marketing campaign in magazines where they had her showing a lot of skin. That's kind of what I remember from it, but actually the game is pretty great. I, I like Descent and I like this one a lot. Um, Next to that, you've got a couple Aliens games there. This one's kind of curious. So this one's called A Comic Book Adventure. This is based on the graphic novel. Now you would think that it, when it says a comic book adventure that it would be like a visual novel or something, but it's really not. It's actually a full blown game. It just got a lot of really high quality for the time, uh, cut scenes and graphic parts to it. So that I think that's why they, they added that. Next to that, you have the Alien Trilogy. So that's based on the first three games. And I believe that also came out, I think on what the PlayStation 1, maybe Saturn, something like that. Here is another very collectible adventure game. This is based on the, the novel, uh, I Have No Mouth and I Must Scream. And this one I believe comes with a mouse pad. Yeah, it does. So another one of these kind of collectible games. Um, a lot of people love this game. I don't think I actually finished it because I didn't get this until fairly recently. Um, but I think it's because of the mouse pad that it's actually somewhat collectible. And then here's three games that I absolutely did finish. So you have Vampire the Masquerade Redemption. When this game came out, it was somewhat flawed. It's, it's, a, it's an RPG, it's a 3D RPG, so it's third person. What's cool about this game is that it goes through time. So it starts off, I believe in the Middle Ages or something like that, I forget the exact era, but, uh, and then your character, spoiler alert, is put to sleep, and then you wake up, I believe in modern times or slightly futuristic, but um, it uses the Vampire the Masquerade kind of pen and paper rules. And so there's a lot of backstory to that game. Again, not a perfect game, but I really enjoyed it at the time. It was pretty cool. And I've mentioned Planescape Torment. <sighs> Man, just such a cool game. It's a game that is so creative. It's so inventive. It's incredibly well-written, great characters. Uh, I, I just, this was a game that if I had to sell my entire collection, this would be one of them that I would never get rid of. And then we have Blade Runner. So this, uh, this is another game that I really enjoyed. So. Basically, you know, before we got the, the official sequel movie a couple years ago, this was considered to be the next best thing. And in many ways, it's very similar to the Ridley Scott original game, uh, game original movie, in that it, I mean, in many ways, it actually follows it almost too closely. 
But what's cool about this game is, and what's crazy about it, is that it's almost completely randomized. So if you play it multiple times, the person you'll meet on the street may be like, like say a bum, maybe one of the characters that you need to talk to later on who works in a hotel, or the hotel person will be, you know, a street walker, or a street walker may actually be, you know, this character or that character, which makes this game incredibly difficult to follow a walkthrough. Um, you, you almost can't really do that. There are some walkthroughs that attempt to do it, uh, but yeah, it's just such a cool game. It was beautiful, really well acted, it, I don't know, it's just very memorable. And I, you know, it's because I'm a huge fan of the original movie that when I found this, I was like, oh, so good. All right, guys, well, I think I'm gonna end this video there because we've obviously covered a lot today, but there is way more I need to show you in future videos. Uh, I haven't talked about the Tomb Raider series yet, Might and Magic, all of those Need for Speed racing games, the SSI RPGs, Ultimas, Warcraft, Diablo, um, all the Sierra stuff, the Half-Life collection. Yeah, there's much, much more that I can talk about in future videos. So if you like this one, please give it a thumbs up, share it on social media, I greatly appreciate it. And uh, yeah, we'll continue the adventure around the game room. But love to know what you guys thought about this video. Please post a comment down below. Uh, let me know if I missed something in my collection that you think I need to add. I'd love to hear it. Thank you very much for watching. Thank you for subscribing and take care. Hey guys, Metal Jesus here, and today I'm back with part two of me sharing with you some of my big box PC game collection. Now you guys loved the first video, it was a lot of fun to make, but the biggest piece of feedback I got is that you like seeing the boxes, but you would love to see the gameplay footage too. Well in this video I'm going to do my best to try to include gameplay footage for most of the games I show in this. It should be really cool, we've got two more shelves to go through, so let's take a look. So we're gonna get started here with the original Tomb Raider games. And I have, I believe the first five of them here. So you have the original Tomb Raider. Now notice that it is in a trapezoid box. And this was something that Eidos did when, when Tomb Raider came out, I guess to probably make it stand out on shelves. This is something that was very common in the PC gaming market at the time. There was no standard of box sizes or even shapes. And this is something that Eidos did for several years. And I remember getting the first Tomb Raider. I played it on PC originally just in software mode, but then I got a rendition 3D accelerated card and this game blew me away. I love the original Tomb Raider. And then you have Tomb Raider Gold here, which is basically the original game with four additional levels. Tomb Raider 2 is kind of where I, I, I played Tomb Raider 2 to the end and I enjoyed it, but this is at the point where I was starting to get a little bit burned out on the series, but it continues on in Tomb Raider 3, as well as Tomb Raider uh, The Last Revelation. Tomb Raider Chronicles, I never touched that game. I think at this point, even the developers were probably getting burned out on creating Tomb Raider games. But I have these in my collection because I like the trapezoid box style. <laughs> and it was so cool that Eidos did this at the time. And they had a bunch of them. And even uh, Legacy of Kane Soul Reaver, it came out on a beautiful trapezoid box. Now, I think most people probably probably played, you know, Legacy of Kain Soul Reaver on the PlayStation, but, uh, you know, they also put it out on PC, which is cool. Continuing on over here, you have more trapezoid boxes, including Joint Strike Fighter. This was this was an unusual release for Eidos at the time. It's a it's a flight sim game that focuses really on stealth. Now I have an entire section of my game room dedicated just to flight sims. It's actually in the other room there. And normally I would put this game over there because that's actually where it belongs, but because it's an Eidos game and because it's a trapezoid, I have it over here. Just one of those silly things I do in my collection. Moving on, you have two master masterpiece games. I love these games so much. You have Thief 1 and 2. Oh man, you know, I know I say it all the time, but I really, really like stealth games. And the reason why I like stealth games is because of the original Thief and the second game. They are just everything I love about their first person. They're, uh, I, would you say medieval? 
uh, Victorian, something like that. But basically, you know, I, I like the era that this exists in. It fits into that stealth uh, gameplay really well. These are very smart games. I like how there's a little bit of fantasy in it as well. There's a little bit of the supernatural. I played those two games so much. Uh, moving on here, we have uh, Reverend, Rever I always say this wrong, Revenant, Revenant. Wasn't there a, a movie called Revenant, right? I think so. So this is a game that came out and I, I don't think it was necessarily that popular at the time. It's considered to be basically, you know, a Diablo clone. And there were a lot of these type of Diablo clones at the, at, at the time, because, you know, once there's a big, once there's a big success like that, a lot of developers, a lot of publishers try to, to, to do that as well. And uh, this was a game that came out that, I don't know if a lot of people loved it or not, but the next game is pretty interesting. That is uh, Omicron, The Nomad Soul. Now, this also came out on the Dreamcast, but uh, the PC version is the one that I dove into initially. And it's a trippy game. It's by Aquatic Dream which uh, made Detroit more than human. And this is a really wild game. It's basically kind of like a third person, open world, futuristic game. It deals with uh, the city that is, has a protective dome over it. And essentially what you do in this game is you can possess or take control of other characters to try to solve uh, mysteries or uh, puzzles, things like that. Uh, another thing that's kind of interesting about this game is that it has multiple play styles. So for instance, if I remember it right, it actually has like first person shooting elements to it. And then it has fighting elements to it, like third person, you know, fighting mechanics. So uh, plus it's it's got an original soundtrack by David Bowie, which at the time you see here, if you open up this flap, you see David Bowie right there. That was a pretty cool little feature of it. So definitely kind of an unusual game. Next to that, you have another game that's a little bit unusual. It's called Urban Chaos. And if, if I remember right, this also came out, I think on the PlayStation 2, I forget. But uh, anyways, this is another game where it's a third person action game, but it takes place in an urban environment. And so it kind of feels almost like Grand Theft Auto a little bit. So kind of a, kind of a cool game. Again, I don't know if it did very well, but uh, it's a trapezoid game, so I had to have it in my collection. Here's another game that I don't think did very well either. That is Conquest Earth. And I believe I got this actually out of a trade that I did, that, that big massive trade that I did a couple years ago. Um, it I haven't played this. It looks like kind of like a like a Warcraft clone. So I remember seeing it advertised in magazines, but I haven't played it. If you've played it, let me know. And then here's an unusual one. When I show people this, they, they, they're they surprised to see this. So it's Final Fantasy VII on the PC. And again, published by Eidos and uh, developed by Squaresoft. So I believe Eidos brought it to the PC. This is the version that I played. When this game came out, this is actually my original copy that I played back in the day. And uh, yeah, I just really loved this game at the time. Uh, the the pre-render backgrounds, plus it also had, uh, you know, the the polygon characters looked really sharp in this game. Sharper than they did on the original PlayStation, for sure. So, a bit of an unusual release in the Final Fantasy series. Next to that, we have one of the classic computer RPGs of all time. That is the Might and Magic series. And, you know, Might and Magic was a series that came out that I played a lot, especially the third game. So I have the third game right here. When, uh, when this game first came out, The Isles of Terra, I just thought this was one of the most beautiful games I'd ever seen. I still, to this day, when I look at the... When I look at the gameplay footage of this, it just takes me back to that time when I was playing this game. It's definitely, you know, there's a lot of games that are kind of similar to this where they are those first person dungeon crawlers. And, um, you know, this was one of the more popular in that, that franchise. I think most people played Eye of the Beholder. That's certainly one that people played at the time. But um, yeah, Might Magic 3 was definitely one of my favorites. And then another one, in those or another two of them that really stood out at the time that were pretty cool. They had these big, speaking of big boxes right here, you have Might and Magic, the Clouds of Zine, 
and then you have dark side of zine and basically the way that this works is that these two games go together and essentially what happens is that if you install both of them on the hard drive then you have access to both of the games at the same time which is pretty crazy because these games are usually pretty big anyways and so here is the selling point that oh you know you get even more right it'd be almost like if you bought all the elder scrolls games and then if you had them all on, on the hard drive every single area would just be opened up to you i mean it's just completely excessive but also really really awesome that they did that i just love these big boxes the artwork um yeah might magic has a a very special place in my heart now it's funny because i'm looking at this and i used to have and i'm surprised i don't they used to have heroes of might and magic i played heroes of might and magic 2 i believe gosh so much so that's that's what i'm gonna have to get for the collection but as for the main games these are the ones in there i ha i didn't really play much beyond uh clouds of zine and also dark side of zine but uh you know i've, I've heard that the uh, the newer ones are eh, a little bit hit and miss i don't know you let me know down in the comments if i should check them out all right moving on we've got a random group of games here starting with terra nova strike force centauri first of all look at that cover that cover is amazing like so many other great big box pc games so this game to me Boy, you know, it's funny because when you look at this now, when you look at the gameplay footage now, this game looks really rough. But back in the day, it was a technical marvel because essentially the big selling point for this game at the time was that all of the graphics were textured. And at the time, that was a very hardware expensive thing to do. Like, you know, uh, it's especially in software. And so I believe this might've been doing voxels or, or something like that, but basically, you know, you are playing a, a, a mechanized power suit and um, shooting and all that sort of stuff. But again, the graphics at the time were the big selling point on this. It, it looked impressive. <laughs> Today, not so much, but uh, yeah. The other thing that was pretty cool about this too is that it had full motion video. Again, another kind of novelty at the time where, ooh, they've got real actors, you know, pretending to, to, to be in the game. That was, that was all the rage at the time. So I have very fond memories of playing Terra Nova at the time. Uh, moving on, we have another game that a lot of people have fond memories of. That is Nocturne. Nocturne is a, you know, it's one of these games where if you played this, you remember this game because it was so unusual and i don't think it got ported to anything else other than the pc but uh yeah so this is this is a game this is a an action survival horror game it takes place in the great depression i believe in the 20s or the 30s and you work for a secret government organization that is trying to investigate these supernatural occurrences and um just a really memorable cool game it's one that I think is ripe for getting an HD remaster or a, a remake or so, of some kind like that. So yeah, just uh, just one of those kind of like hidden gems, but yet if you played it, you definitely loved it. And next to that are two more games that I remember fondly. So you have Crusader, No Remorse and No Regret. And the funny thing about these games is that if you show these to anybody, they go, wow, that looks just like Boba Fett. And they're right. I mean, it totally does. It's very funny, although these are not Star Wars games at all. Uh, basically, they are they are isometric shooting action games that at the time were pretty unusual because you might see games like that on consoles, at least at the time, but not so much on PCs. And these were just beautiful, really great looking games. Now, the, the downside to them, unfortunately, was that the controls were very clunky. I, if I'm trying to remember right, you use the mouse to shoot or something or to aim, and then platforming was not great. <laughs> you kind of had to line up to, to platform, but you know, I didn't care. I was I was all in on these games. I thought they were so cool. These were, were games by uh, Origin, and Origin just made some amazing games on the PC, and these are two really cool ones. Next to that is a racing game that I still play today, and that is Revolt. Revolt is an RC, remote control racing game. Uh, mostly I play this actually on the Dreamcast because the Dreamcast got a really great port of it. I believe it also came out on the N64. 
but uh, but it was the PC version I played first, and I still think this is a fantastic game. I love the scale, how how you're shrunk down, you know, to a to a remote control in an RC car. It's really cool. The levels are really really interesting. They're all kind of real world. You're in a neighborhood. You're in a supermarket. Stuff like that. Uh, really tight controls. This is a fantastic version on the PC. Next up is a survival horror game that took me forever to get. Um, and I wanted it pretty much for its box. <laughs> uh, that is Flesh Feast. Now this is published by Sega on the PC. So this is a pretty trippy Sega game that came out on the PC. But look at that cover. It's absolutely disgusting. It's so, and even the, even the back is like disturbing. So, so basically this is a top-down survival horror game. I don't really think it's necessarily that good, but again, it's really cool because of the cover. <laughs> so that's kind of why I wanted it. I know it's really dumb, but that's that's true. Uh, there's also a t-shirt in here uh, that originally when I got this, it did not have, but a really cool fan of the channel sent me his, he had a, a t-shirt that he had in his. And so uh, just a really trippy, disturbing Sega game. Next up is a really interesting sci-fi RPG called Anachronics. I remember when this was, was released, you saw ads all over the gaming magazines. Um, there was a lot of hype for it. Now, I don't know if it necessarily did very well, which is, if that's true, that's definitely, that's definitely <laughs> disappointing because it's such a cool uh, RPG. It basically tries to mix Japanese style and also Western style into one massive RPG. And for the most part, actually, it succeeds really well. Also, this game is known for being very quirky, very funny, um, just lots of personable characters and dialogue. Uh, plus, it's also got a really cool combat system. So just a really interesting release for, oh yeah, so, so Ion Storm made it, but it was published by Eidos. <laughs> That's cool. So. Yeah, definitely a gem in my collection. Moving on, I'm gonna be curious to hear how many of you remember a game called Z? Now, back in the day, correct me if I'm wrong, but I remember when this first came out and really it was compared big time to uh, Warcraft 2. And in many ways, a lot of people would kind of have a little bit of a back and forth as to which one was better. Now you gotta keep in mind, this was what, 1996, I think. But at the time, Z was a pretty cool real-time strategy game and it went up against Warcraft 2. That's a, uh, obviously Warcraft 2 is way more popular, but still, I, I have a, a soft spot for this game right here. Next up is a game I'm sure many of you played on the PlayStation, that is G-Police. And this is the PC version, obviously, but I think most people played it on, on the PlayStation. But for me, it was all about the 3D acceleration in this game. Uh, it, if you don't know, this is a futuristic helicopter game that at the time was groundbreaking with its graphics. I thought it was so beautiful at the time. I just had all these light flares and all these special effects. It was a, it was a showcase for the, uh, the 3D acceleration doesn't really hold up that much today. Uh, would be another game that'd be pretty cool to get some sort of like, you know, HD remaster or something like that. Next up is a game that is featured a lot on my channel. And that of course is Interstate 76. This is a car combat game that takes place in an alternate future where there's a gas crisis and uh, you play, I believe is the, the, the Groove Champion who is a uh, vigilante and you're cruising around doing car combat, had a really cool graphic style. Um, man, I just love this game so much. I, I bought Interstate 82, the sequel, but didn't really get into it as much for some reason. The, 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 the original will always be one of my all-time favorites. Next up is a really interesting release called Shattered Steel. Now, the reason why this is kind of interesting is because it is a Bioware game. Yes. The same developer that made Baldur's Gate, as well as Mass Effect and all those games. But way back in the day, they made a mech game, which is so interesting. Now, for some reason, I have the Sealed, which is really... I must have gotten this more recently. 
But um, yeah, you know, I have this in my collection because again, it's kind of a weird Bioware release. Next up is a really interesting adventure game called Spycraft, The Great Game by Activision. Now, when this first came out, it was very different than everything else that was out at the time because it's an adventure game, but it uses full motion video and it takes place kind of in the real world. So it deals with real espionage, real spy stuff. Uh, you play as a CIA operative and essentially they worked with real people who had knowledge of spy stuff in the US to come up with the scenarios that this game deals with. So um, you, you're trying to solve puzzles, you're trying to figure out maybe what's going on in this deeper conspiracy. Um, it deals with assassinations. Um, it's this all kind of doomsday cloak and dagger stuff. Very cool game. Uh, I don't know if a lot of people remember it, but I certainly do. I thought it was a really cool game at the time. Next up is another kind of unusual Final Fantasy release. This is Final Fantasy VIII on the PC, not by Eidos. So this was released by Squaresoft. And I got this one way after it was originally released. Uh, I forget where I got this, but just kind of another unusual PC version of a game that most people, you know, kind of equate with the original PlayStation, but really nice box, cool to have it on the PC. And speaking of adventure games, here is one that a lot of people consider to be one of the best ever made. That is The Last Express. My copy is signed by the guy who created it. So this game was five years in the making and cost millions of dollars. And ultimately it failed when it was originally released, which is really sad. But basically what you can see here is that it is uh, a game that takes place on the Orient Express. So you're on that train, kind of like almost like an Agatha Christie novel where you're trying to solve these murders. Now, what's interesting about this game is that it is a ton of rotoscoping over real actors. And so it has a very unusual look to it. And I think that's the reason why it probably took so long because rotoscoping back then took forever to do. Um, the other thing about this is that I believe if I remember right, all of the scenarios happen kind of in real time. So there's a real sense of urgency to this game to try to get through it and solve it, uh, you know, in the time that you have. So yeah, just a, a really cool piece of history here if you like adventure games. I believe this is out on GOG.com. Uh, I could be wrong about that, but I know that that was originally, originally it failed, but it was resurrected because so many people wanted to play it. All right, moving down to this shelf, we're gonna start with a section where I have a bunch of Need for Speed games, including a really special one here. This is Hot Pursuit, the 2010 version, but this copy right here was only given out to EA employees during that holiday season. Uh, actually, a, a viewer of my channel sent this to me who worked there, who knows that I'm a big fan of that series. And as you can see, it has a really interesting and cool slip cover right here. It says Hot Pursuit right there. Uh, EA Crew Edition 2010, you open it up and there's a nice message right there. It says Happy Holidays. You pull the disc out or the, the, the DVD cover here and you see that it says on the spine, EA Crew Edition 2010 has its own unique cover. You open it up and the disc is uh, not for resale. Looks like a maybe an internal gold master version of it. And then on the back, it shows that it actually comes with seven exclusive cars that are not in the retail version. So I thought this was really cool because that is a great Need for Speed game. And uh, this is a pretty unusual version of that game. And then as for the Need for Speed games, I've got a bunch of my favorites in here, especially the early ones, uh, including the original. Road and Track presents the Need for Speed. This is a special edition of that. That's the very first version I ever played of that. And then I have two versions of the second game. That's because the second game for a long time was my favorite. And uh, so there's the SE version of that as well. Then you have Porsche Unleashed, which I love that, that game. That's the one where it really focuses on the history of Porsche. And then check this out. This is called Motor City Online. Now this was almost called a Need for Speed game, but they decided to change the name at the last minute. But essentially it, what it is, is that it is a massively multiplayer online racing game that came out and 
it wasn't very successful. I think it was a little bit ahead of its time. Um, I, w when this came out, I did not have internet that would support it. And so I didn't play it when it came out. I actually got this copy years later, but I think it was ahead of its time. I think now you could do it and people will probably be all over it. Moving on, we've got a bunch of SSI games here and some of these I played and others I actually got during that big 600 game pickup that I did with Kinsey a couple years ago. So I'm not super familiar with all of these, but uh, this is one I was really excited to get primarily just for the cover. <laughs> But also I like Space Sims. So that's Renegade Battle for Jacob Star. Again, it's SSI. Unfortunately, this game, it, it's, well, it's a sequel to, I believe it's called Interceptor, um, which I think is based on a physical board game. I hope I'm right about that. But, you know, I like Flight Sims. And so this is one that, that I didn't play at the time and I thought it was pretty cool. So had to pick that one up. These I did get in that, that pickup. So. Haven't played a ton of these, but we have Warwind 1 and 2, which are, I believe, real-time strategy games similar to Warcraft, or like Warcraft 2. So that's pretty cool. We also have two games here that take place in the same universe called uh, World of Aiden. You have Thunderscape, which has an epic cover. Uh, then you have Endomorph, Plague of the Darkfall. So these both, as you see here on the covers, they, they take place in this world of Aiden. And SSI did the, a lot of that, where they would have different games that take place in different worlds or different universes. And so um, Thunderscape is a traditional RPG and looks kind of similar to, I would say, like, like Ultima Underworld, probably. And then Endomorph is more of a 2D action or I don't know if you necessarily say 2D, but basically I, I know parts of this are 2D, but it's like an action puzzle game. Next up is a game I never thought we'd actually see. I was surprised to see it when it was announced and that is Tron 2.0 because back in like, I think 2003 when this was announced, we didn't have a sequel to the original 1980s movie. So to see a Tron video game come out so much later, like years, decades later, I was like blown away because I love the original movie. And this is actually a pretty cool first person shooter. So, I mean, it basically uses a lot of those Tron look and feel, but throws you into the first person mode. And it's unlike anything I've ever played. If you like the original movie, if you if you dig that kind of style, you definitely have to check this game out. It also came on, on Xbox. That's where I originally played it. Um, but just a very unique and unusual first person shooter. We got a couple RPGs here, including The Summoning, put out by SSI. Another classic RPG back on the computers back in the day. This is definitely an old game, but one that is much loved. And then here's another one that's newer that a lot of people really love too. That is uh, Septera Core Legacy of the Creator. And I believe this box here actually might be a European box. It looks a little bit different than, huh, I forget where I got this. But anyway, so uh, Sep Septera Core is a Western made RPG, but made to be kind of in that Japanese style, the JRP style. Um, so all the characters and things like that have that sort of anime look to it. Uh, the, the premise of this game is really cool because you are on this world that has these floating continents. And so there's like layers to it. And in the center of it is a computer and there's all these sci-fi tropes and stuff like that. Definitely a very unique game. I think you can get this on uh, GOG.com. And then here's a game that a lot of people to this day still consider to be one of the greatest games ever made. That is Star Control 2. So this is a space exploration game where it's just a massive universe, massive galaxy to explore, but it's got combat, it's got RPG, it's got, uh, like I said, it's just, it's just everything poured into one game. Uh, love, love that cover. So yeah, this is definitely one that I think a lot of people who gamed in the late 80s and early 90s, you know, are looking for for their collections. And then another beloved first person shooter is Kingpin. And I think we were all kind of blown away that they're actually making a remastered version of this game. Now, when Kingpin first came out, <laughs> it was so violent and so 
adult that it kind of blew people away. It was like, it was one of those, it was one of those games almost like, you know, like Grand Theft Auto where people are like, whoa, games can be that violent or have that much swearing in it. Uh, definitely over the top, but a really good game. Very difficult game too. This game will kick your butt. And then next up is one of my all-time favorite arcade racing games, especially from the era, that is Speed Busters. And Speed Busters is, you know, it, it looks and plays like your typical arcade racing game from the time, but at, you know, it used 3D acceleration. It used a 3D FX card, looked beautiful. There is a version of this on uh, the Dreamcast called Speed Devils, which is also very good, but I originally played Speed Busters. That's how I know it. But uh, even today, I still go back and play this game every once in a while just because it's it's fun. It's It's got great, cars, great controls. I know all the tracks really well, so it's a classic. And then I have two games that I kind of put together, and you'll see why. It's because one of them is Stunts by Broderbund, and the other one is Stunt Driver by Spectrum Holobyte. So I played Stunts way, way more. I loved this game at the time. I played it so much. I mean, just, just, I don't know, at the time there was there was definitely a movement of making these kind of stunt-like games, even though the computers could barely run them in my opinion, but they were still really fun. Uh, plus you could create your own tracks and things like that. And then uh, Stunt Driver, I don't know if I've ever played this game, but it looks very similar to Stunts. But uh, it says on the, on the cover there that it supports the AdLib sound card. So it just shows you just how old these games are, but yeah, like I said, I have a soft spot for the original stunts. And then here's a game that was considered very technically advanced for the time. That is a Realms of the Haunting. Uh, this is by Interplay. And this is basically a first person 3D adventure slash survival horror game that just really pushed the boundaries of what these games could do at the time. Had full 3D environments, which, you know, obviously look really dated today, but at the time it was really pushing you know, pushing the hardware, plus it had full 640 by 480 visuals. So it had SVGA mode, uh, plus it also had, if I remember right, uh, full motion video. So those are a lot of the things, you know, plus sound and voices and things like that. Just these kind of multimedia experiences, games that push those were, were very groundbreaking for the time and were really exciting. And this is definitely one of them. And then moving on to the last section, at least for this video, we have Return to Castle Wolfenstein. This is in a metal tin, which I believe is a little bit collectible. I'm not sure about that, but uh, inside of here you have a little patch, which is pretty cool. You also have a little poster and manual as well as the disc. But I guess the, uh, the metal tin version, again, is somewhat collectible and a little bit unique. And then check out these releases. So if you watch my videos on going to Japan, they're gonna look kind of familiar. These are a bunch of PC Windows versions, actually Windows XP specifically versions of the Ease series. And these are all sealed. And we got these in Japan, actually Tony did. So uh, he bought these, you can see them right here, for 100 yen or basically $1 a piece, sealed. <laughs> So he, he found these, bought these, and then uh, I think he just gave them to me just because he doesn't collect big box PC games. But, uh, you know, these are all in Japanese. I don't even know if they have English on them, but they're just so cool and unusual that they had to be part of the collection. And then here's a game that my roommate at the time played a lot. I remember him playing this quite a bit. Protostar War on the Frontier. I remember it's primarily because of this awesome cover. This publisher always had the best game covers. Although if I remember right, we had a hard time getting this to work because it really required a lot of conventional memory and we struggled to get it to work on this computer. But um, basically this game's very similar to like Star Control, that kind, of, that kind of game, kind of space exploration type game. And then finally, another RPG that a lot of people love, that is Nox. I actually have a poster on my wall up there of the lady right there. Nox is another one of those games that came out at the time that I don't know if it was as successful as they had hoped, but it was definitely a really high quality game. I think the problem with this game is that, you know, it got compared to uh, Diablo 2. 
A lot of people put out Diablo-like clones. Some of them were better than others. And Nox is definitely considered to be one of the better ones that came out. Uh, great graphics, great controls, uh, really cool story. So just one of those games that kind of time is forgotten. Although it wouldn't surprise me if it's not on GOG.com. I should probably check that. So anyways, guys, that's part two, looking at my big box PC game collection, but there is much more to show if you guys want me to. Uh, down here, we have the Jagged Alliance series, Ultimas, Wizardry. We have some more Origin games, uh, Psygnosis. We got Blizzard, more SSI games, Sierra. It just goes on and on and on, and that's just this room. So if you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. Uh, as always, guys, I want to thank you for watching my channel. Thank you for subscribing, and take care. Hey guys, I am The Metal Jesus, and today I'm very excited to talk about one of the most influential RPG series of all time, and that is the classic SSI Gold Box series of RPGs that were released back in the late 80s to early 90s. For a lot of people like me, it's what got me into RPGs. This was groundbreaking for the time, and the entire series is pretty amazing, especially if you are a big box PC collector like myself, we look at these and we just get nostalgic. We get all misty eyed. But more than that, it really covered a lot of ground. It broke a lot of rules. Another thing to note too, is that in this video, I'm gonna show you one of the games in the series, and it just happens to be one of the most collectible and rare RPGs in all of PC gaming. It's a pretty cool series. I think you guys are gonna like it. Let's take a look. Now, before we get into the collecting aspect of it, let's talk about the games themselves and why they're so fondly remembered. First up, this is not a watered down hack and slash game, but a full blown stat driven advanced Dungeons and Dragons RPG experience on your computer. Populated cities, colorful characters, dungeons, missions, dialogue, and even strategic battles were all here, just like the pen and paper games you would play with your friends, but sitting at the kitchen table. SSI essentially took what made the wizardry and also Ultima games great and then built upon them. These games had the typical first person dungeon crawl and exploration in the upper left window, but they added a fully tactical combat engine for battles. And then to help complete the look, because these games were fully licensed, the artists even recreated the monster portraits taken directly from the printed monster manuals. So let's talk about the games themselves. This is Pool of Radiance. This came out on the Commodore 64 back in 1988. This is my original copy here, but it also came out on other systems. I also have the MS-DOS version. One of the reasons why I love collecting big box PC games is because they come with all sorts of really cool stuff. And this game is no exception. This is not a collector's edition. This is just what came with it. So we have the floppy disks, and you also have the Wheel of Translation, which is essentially copy protection. A bit deeper into the box, you get the manual. Now this is designed for people who are not familiar with how advanced Dungeons and Dragons work. This is the Adventurer's Journal, and this is a must for playing the game. To start off with, there's over eight pages just in the beginning of this, explaining the entire world, the city that you're gonna be exploring, every little detail that you need to get involved in the game and understand what's happening. A bit later into this book, you're going to run into the proclamations of the city council. Notice that they're numbered, and that's because in the game, it will tell you to flip to this page so that you can read the details of what's going on in the city. Next up are journal entries, and notice that they're numbered. So what happens in the game is that they'll refer back to these. They'll tell you to go check out journal entry number 12, and then you'll flip to this page, read it, You'll get some backstory, maybe get a hint or two, and then continue on with the game. However, what's really clever about this is that you can't cheat it. So for instance, some of these journal entries are actually false. Some of these will actually steer you in the wrong direction. So you can't necessarily read ahead because the first time you play the game, you don't know which ones are actually true. It's pretty cool. And if you collect these kind of games, you're definitely gonna wanna make sure that this is included in your box. A nice bonus of this particular copy is the Clue Book. One of the challenges of these original games is that they did not have in-game maps. So what that meant was, is that you as the player would have grid paper and create your own maps as you played the game. Now, I look fondly back on that experience. I thought it was pretty fun at the time, but just be aware if you're first starting this game, it can be a bit of a challenge without that Clue Book. 
The second game in the series is called Curse of the Azure Bonds, and it was released in 1989. Some of the highlights for this game include the ability to bring over your previous party. That's pretty awesome. Also, this game raised the level caps. It added side quests, and also it improved some of the interface. Oh yeah, and then here are my handwritten notes and maps that I mentioned previously. Ah oh, man, it brings back memories. Here is the third game in the series called Secret of the Silver Blades, released in 1990. Now for the most part, this game was not well received, primarily because players ran into gameplay balance issues whenever they imported their party from the previous games. Kind of a bummer. And finally, we get the fourth game in the Forgotten Realm series called The Pools of Darkness, released in 1991. This game is considered a great ending to the saga and your band of characters. It had much improved graphics as well. SSI wanted even more games set in the Forgotten Realms universe, so they ended up outsourcing some of these to Stormfront Studios. Does Stormfront Studios sound familiar? It did to me. Well, it turns out that they also created the Lord of the Rings Two Towers games for EA, as well as the beloved Demon Stone and Bloodweight games. So in 1991, they created Gateway to the Savage Frontier, and then a year later, they followed it up with Treasures of the Savage Frontier, again using the same SSI Goldbox engine that players already know and love. However, it was Neverwinter Nights that Stormfront Studios broke all kinds of ground. They basically took that time-tested Goldbox engine and modified it for AOL to become the world's first graphical, massively multiplayer online role-playing game. This is long before other games like Ultima Online, Meridian 59, and even Sierra's own The Realm Online. And it's because of its place in gaming history that this game is sought after by collectors like me, often selling for hundreds of dollars. SSI wasn't done with the Gold Box engine just yet. They also launched a trilogy of role-playing games based on the Dragonlance universe. First up was Champions of Kryn in 1990, followed up by Death Knights of Kryn, and then finally, The Dark Queen of Kryn in 1992. And then SSI threw fans a bit of a curveball by releasing two games based on the Buck Rogers universe using the Gold Box engine. Here's a bit of an oddity. This is a one-off game that they did that does use the Goldbox engine. It's called Space Jammer Pirates of Realm Space, released in 1992. Now, I just recently got this in my collection. I haven't played it personally, but people describe it as a fantasy space adventure that is often compared to the Planescape universe. Pretty cool. And then finally, the last release that does use the Goldbox engine is called Forgotten Realms Unlimited Adventures. Basically, it's a gift to all those fans who love this series. It's an RPG maker and editor who want to keep the good times rolling, who want to make their own gold box games. At the end here, I want to mention where you can get these games today and how you can play them today. The easiest way by far is to just go buy them at GOG.com, goodoldgames.com. They've acquired the rights to these. They've updated them to work on modern versions of Windows and Mac and Linux and they're dirt cheap. So I actually have paid for and bought pretty much all of these games at GOG.com. What's great about it too is they've also digitized all of the maps, all of the journals, everything you need to play it on a modern system. But that's not all. Some Uber fans have created something called the Gold Box Companion. This is an add-on that modifies and enhances these games for today. For instance, it adds auto mapping, which is huge. It also adds easy to use journal entries and helps with some of the interface issues, making it less tedious. I'll add a link to GOG and the Gold Box Companion in the video description below. So that's a quick look at my SSI Gold Box collection. Now I'd love to know down in the comments what you guys thought about this. Also, I have a lot more big box PC games from the 80s and 90s, and I'd love to know if you guys would like to see more of this content on my channel. There's a bunch more that I could do. I could cover the Wizardry collection, uh, the Infocom text adventures. I could cover the Baldur's Gate series, maybe more SSI games, so much potential. Love to know what you guys thought. As always, I wanna thank you for watching my channel. Thank you for subscribing and take care. Some other computer role-playing games I was obsessed with in the 90s were I the Beholder. Oh my God, they were so beautiful for the time. And then also the Might and Magic series, specifically the third and fourth games were just so epic and so killer. All right, guys, thanks so much for watching.
Hey guys, Middle Jesus here. Now I suspect that most of the viewers of my channel are already familiar with some of the more rare and collectible console games. But I do get the question a lot from people who wanna know what are some of the more rare and collectible big box PC games. In this video, I'm gonna show you a bunch of them, tell you what makes them kind of special and rare and also hard to find, and I think it's gonna really surprise you. Let's take a look. Now I mentioned surprises, and this is definitely a surprise for me because I had no idea how much this game had gone up in value. So this is the original Gabriel Knight from Sierra, and this is the origami release is what they call this. This is basically a really weird box that we put out back when this game came out on CD-ROM. And as you can see here, this is still sealed. This copy right here is actually my buddy uh, Joshua, the big JB's copy here. But I had no idea that this thing had gone up in value. One recently sold for $800 on eBay. I'm shocked. Here's something pretty cool. This is Doom, the registered mail order version. Now you're probably wondering, what's the big deal? I mean, Doom came out on every system. But if you notice, this is actually a smaller box. And that's because this would be the version that you would have got had you actually mail ordered this directly from id software now get this this sells currently for about 350 dollars in great condition and i think it's worth mentioning at this point that probably the reason why this is so unusual and so rare is because so few people would have bought it this way most people would have bought the big box version at their local store here is the Duke Nukem 2 registered version, and this typically goes for about $150 or so if you can get the original box version, which if you are a gamer like me, you know this is kind of unusual because we would play the shareware version to death. It was very unusual to actually see a big box version like this. And many of these early 2D platforming games on the PC are somewhat collectible. So here you see Jazz Jackrabbit 2, which goes for about $100. But the thing is, is that if you were a PC gamer like me at the time, 2D platformers that were good were actually pretty hard to find. And so we have a lot of nostalgia built up for some of these really good ones. It's worth noting that this release of uh, Jazz Jackrabbit 2 is actually from Epic Mega Games, but we know that as Epic Games Today, which of course went on to make Unreal and Gears of War and so many other great games. I like how this game here comes with a mini color comic book built into the front of the manual. So cool. Here's something you don't see every day. Now, obviously some of you are familiar with Infocom. They made great text adventures, but this game here is special, specifically this release. So this of course is suspended, but it's the mask box. And as you can see here, why it would be called that because it has this really weird plastic 3D mask in there. And uh, it's very uncommon to find it in such good condition like this. That mask over time gets brittle and will break. As you can see, this one is obviously in very good condition. And typically these go for about $150 or so. Speaking of the Infocom games, their most popular series of games are of course the Zork games. Now here is the Zork trilogy. And this is interesting because this is one of the more collectible Infocom games out there, which is kind of unusual because the Zork games would have sold very well. But this trilogy has something really cool. It has all the, the feelies or extras you would expect, but in here is a very special metal coin. And I believe it only came in this version of it. And it's made of metal, it's very heavy, and technically it's the currency that you use in these games. So a lot of people are looking for this particular version of the game, especially if you're a Zork fan. The bummer is that there are counterfeits out there. People make counterfeits of this thing, so you have to kind of be careful. It's just really hard to find original complete copies of this game. But if you do, well, it's gonna cost you $200 or more. This is the version of Ultima 1 that a lot of us remember playing back in the day. That cover is absolutely a classic. However, not many people realize that this is actually a remake of the 1981 original that was sold in baggies. 
If you're lucky enough to find one of those baggy versions from 1981, well, those things go for $2,000 or more. They're extremely hard to find. This version right here is definitely a little bit more reasonable. It'll cost you about 200 bucks or so, depending on the version. The PC version tends to you know, command the most amount of money. I just like the fact that it comes with these coins and normally, at least in later releases of Ultima, they would have a cloth map. This one actually has the map broken out into regions on cards. Very cool. Do you remember way back when EA was a well-respected game publisher full of all sorts of creative ideas? And at that time, they put out these really cool, thin album cover style games. Do you remember those? I certainly do. And one RPG that came out on that format that is well-remembered, especially on the Apple II, is the original Wasteland. Wasteland is now considered a classic RPG, and it's an early example of a role-playing game with a persistent world. Now, it also is the inspiration for the later Fallout games. What's interesting from a collecting standpoint is that they radically changed the packaging when they brought it over to the PC. This obviously looks much more like every other PC release at the time, and it's hard to say which one is actually more collectible. Me personally, I like the original Apple II version, but both will cost you about 100 to say 120 bucks, depending on what box you prefer. You can't talk about big box PC collecting without at least mentioning some of the amazing releases that LucasArts slash LucasFilm games made back then, because so many of them are beloved. And here's something you don't see every day. This is the Day of the Tentacle. This is, of course, the Triangle Box. Very hard to find, highly sought after, and this is gonna set you back, well, it's gonna hurt, but it's gonna cost you about $300 or more. And some gamers may not realize that Lucasfilm's very first adventure game is Labyrinth, based on the movie. And so collectors going for a complete collection, well, they're gonna drop about $150 for this. Here's an adventure game that most of us are familiar with. This, of course, is The Secret of Monkey Island. However, you may not realize that there are multiple versions of this. This one right here you see is the 16 color version. This is the very first release of this game. And therefore it's actually harder to find than the 256 color version that came out later. I like how these games are packed full of stuff, including the adventurer newspaper. And here is Dial a Pirate, which was used for the copy protection. If you want the original 16 color version, well, it's gonna cost you anywhere from $150 to $200. Maniac Mansion is another adventure game that a lot of gamers like me grew up with, loved it, and now we wanna put it into our collection. But because they're getting a little bit hard to find, especially complete, eh, they're getting pricey. Now this one's not crazy. This was, you know, gonna cost you about 100 to $150 with all the stuff in there. I do wanna mention though that there are times when gamers like me, collectors like me, we don't even really care if the floppy disks work. I know that's what I think because you know, I can get the game somewhere else. I can go to GOG.com or maybe get it off Steam or get it in a more modern compilation, but it's all this extra stuff here, all this really cool copy protection, the maps, the, the merchandising, the catalogs, that's the stuff that you're paying for, that original stuff that came with these games. Continuing on with the classic Lucasfilm slash LucasArts adventure games, of course you have Zack McCracken and the Alien Mindbenders, another game that a lot of people would like to own, and eh, depending on the version, this might cost you anywhere from like a $120 to up to $200. Loom is another Lucas game that can take a long time to find, especially if you want a complete copy. What's cool about this release is that buried at the bottom of the box, underneath all the floppies and the hint books and manuals and stuff, is a cassette. And this is actually kind of like a radio play. It can be tough to get a complete copy of this game with that cassette because I think most people at the time took that cassette and put it with their other cassettes, you know, next to their stereo and forgot to put it back in the box. So getting it complete is gonna cost you about $100 or so. Here is the version of The Prince of Persia that I remember. This is called the Trapezoid release. And as you can see, the, the cardboard bottom pulls out there and you can get access to the manual and the floppies, stuff like that. And here's the second game in the series. It has a similar style, but of course it's reversed. But the original version was released in 1989 on the Apple II and then ported to other platforms. I'm showing the Tandy version right here. The original game is gonna cost anywhere from $70 to $120, depending on the version. 
Here's a series of RPGs that many of us are very familiar with. That is, of course, the Elder Scrolls series. And the first game is Arena. Now, this game goes for about $150 to $200, depending on the condition. I think Daggerfall is a little bit more easy to find these days, but it still can set you back about $100 to $150. I absolutely love that foil cover right there, the way the light plays upon it. So sexy. And then there are two offshoot games that can be relatively hard to find, although they're not super expensive. The first one is Red Guard. And then the second one is Battlespire. Now, Battlespire is really interesting because that's technically a survival horror style game. And both of those can cost about a hundred bucks or so if they're open, obviously more if they're sealed. Ultima 7 The Black Gate is a relatively easy game to find, not super collectible, but what is collectible are the two expansion packs. You can pay anywhere from $120 to $200 a piece for these expansion packs because they're relatively hard to find now in good condition. Here's something I first heard about from Chris Kohler, and that is the original version of King's Quest. This was released on the IBM PC Junior, and notice it's a clamshell release. It looks like business software. And frankly, the reason why it does look like business software is because Sierra made a deal with IBM to develop the game and showcase the computer, but it ultimately flopped. If you can find a copy of this with a keyboard overlay, it'll set you back about $150. Many modern gamers got introduced to the Fallout series in the third game, but many retro gamers like me look fondly back to the original first two. And because of that reason, they're somewhat sought after. So depending on how complete they are in the condition, well, you can pay anywhere from say $150 to maybe $200 and definitely more if they're sealed. What's interesting though, is that Fallout Tactics doesn't exactly command a high price, even though I think getting the big box version like this is way more difficult than the previous two. And I think it's simply because the game is not as, you know, well-regarded. People aren't quite as nostalgic for it. Here's another Sierra game that I had no idea was so sought after and so collectible these days. This of course is Quest for Glory 4, Shadows of Darkness. This is nicknamed the Purple Box. Now, depending on condition, this can go for say $100 up to $200 or more. Now, the reason why this surprises me so much is because while we were at Sierra, these were everywhere. We had them, you know, you would, you would, you'd have like 10 boxes stacked high. So it's kind of funny to me that this is the one that a lot of collectors want, but the fourth game is considered the best in the series. So obviously a lot of fans are nostalgic for it. And this is the original release. So this is the one that they want. Some collectors may forget that console games and arcade games occasionally made their way to the PC. You see Super C here, which of course is a Contra game, and it is very collectible on PC, as well as the original Metal Gear, also on PC. People don't realize this. And what's funny is that both of these versions are considered to be pretty much terrible but they are some of the more rare and difficult Contra and Metal Gear games to find. So if you're going for a complete collection, you can spend anywhere from 200 to $300, depending on the condition and whether it's sealed or not. So that's a quick look at some of the more rare and collectible big box PC games, but I do need to do a huge shout out to Kevin Ng, who's a collector here in the Seattle area. Most of these games are actually his. His collection is epic, I'm so jealous. And he helped me out greatly with this video. As a matter of fact, if you are looking for help, if you go out to a thrift store or a pawn shop, or, and you find something that you don't know what it is, or maybe you just wanna learn more about this type of collecting, he's an admin and part of an amazing Facebook group called the Big Box PC Game Collecting Group. I'll put a link down in the video description below. If you're remotely interested in learning about Big Box PC games, some of the more special titles to look out for, I highly recommend that you join it. It's, it's amazing. Also, I'd love to know what you thought about this video because we have just touched the tip of the iceberg when it comes to big box PC game collecting because literally there are tens of thousands of them. And while I think we covered more kind of known titles in this video, we can go really obscure really rare and uh, it'd be fun to do that. So let me know in the comments below if you like this video and would like to see more. All right guys, thank you very much for watching. Thank you for subscribing and take care. At the end here, 
I do want to bring something up, and that is occasionally people accuse me of trying to raise the prices of video games. And that is absolutely not my intention with a video like this. It really isn't. I mean, I'm not a reseller myself. And honestly, the pool of people that are looking for PC games like this is really small. Most of these games were already expensive. My goal with this is simply just to educate and also celebrate how cool and collectible these games are. All right, guys. Have a great, great day.